Good morning. Good. The speaker's on. He's the guy that's in control in the back with the voice, so if you don't hear me, someone else. Um, this week was a good week in Kansas, wasn't it? No? You guys didn't enjoy the freezing cold weather? No? And the earthquake on Wednesday? That's big news. And then uh, Saturday, no snow. I was disappointed. And then this morning, snow. So this is a great week for me. I love snow. I was going to say God hears my prayers, but I think we'd have some theological issues with that. But anyways, I'm glad that you guys are here this morning worshiping with us. We're in the book of John, chap- yes, book of John chapter 9, and this week we're going to finish it up. I'm kind of standing in for Pastor Brad, and in the bulletin it tells you where he's at. I read it and I still forgot where it's at, so there goes my memory. This morning, the title is Object, Subject, and Subject. Ha! I'll let you guys think about that. I always like titles to throw you guys off a little bit. So, this week we will finish the story of Jesus and the man who was born blind. Over the last two weeks, we saw how Jesus brought people to a clearer understanding about God, and it started with his disciples. It's always good, I say, to have checks and balances between our ideologies, traditions, and interpretations of the Word of God. Sometimes we think we have the best interpretation. I know sometimes I think that. We saw the will of God in the life of someone who was only waiting for daily misery. This guy, when he got up in the morning, he was out begging. More than likely, that's what he did. That's all he was expecting in life. And then, on that day, Jesus Christ passed by. His life was physically transformed, the life of his parents were changed, and the religious community was in an uproar. I think Jesus did this on purpose. I personally think Jesus did this on purpose. This week, Jesus will come to him a second time, not for a physical checkup, but to offer him true sight, spiritual sight, salvation. Would you turn with me to John chapter 9, verses 35 through 41. All right, if you're there, I'm reading out of the ESV. Jesus heard that he had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to him, if you were blind, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this opportunity to share. Lord, I pray that you would quicken our hearts like you quickened the hearts of this blind man. That you'd continue to open our eyes. Lord, if there's someone here that needs to receive your love this morning, that they would experience your love. If there's someone here that needs to come to know you as Savior and Lord, Lord, that would happen too. Lord, I pray that you'd guide my lips as I speak this morning and that you'd be with us this morning. Amen. So, verse 35 tells us, Jesus heard that they had cast this man, and last week I gave him the name George, out of the temple. Okay, they kicked him out. And so Jesus came back to him. 
I think sometimes we don't know how God is working in our lives. He starts a chain reaction. He starts something, and then he kind of steps back and just lets stuff happen. And then he steps back in. This guy didn't know really who had met him. He thought it was a prophet. And then Jesus just let things happen. First it was the crowd. They saw him. Is this really the guy who was blind before? Let's take him to the Pharisees. Let's take him to the Sanhedrin. They should know better. They didn't want to believe, so they got his parents. Well, his parents didn't want to get in trouble, so they said, well, ask him. Well, the Sanhedrin said, well, were you blind or not? And then he started to give them a little bit of a lesson because he said, hey, if you guys don't believe in this guy and he opened my eyes, he must be from God. They didn't like that, so they kicked him out. He's now socially, before he was socially rejected, now he's outside of the church because he got kicked out of the church. It would have been equivalent to the church back then. So he's got nowhere to go. And just when he thinks he might be by himself, Jesus comes back to him. Jesus comes back to him. And he says to him, do you believe in the Son of God? The first time Jesus came to George, he was physically blind. Pastor Brad would call that the first stages of discipleship. I know he's shown that diagram up there. I just do better without that stuff, so I just leave that to him. This time, he wasn't coming because of physical blindness. This time he was coming because of spiritual blindness. Jesus meets us at our level. Jesus meets us at our level. Attention. That's your French word for today. I did not say that Jesus lowered his standards. He met him where he was at. Whatever your situation, right now, Jesus is willing to reach out into that situation and bring about change, wherever you might be. When Jesus approached this man that was blind, he did not seem interested in the fact that he was able to see. He didn't come back to him to say, hey, do you have 20-20 vision? Can you see over there? That's not why Jesus came back to him. He asked him, do you believe? Because there were a group of people that didn't believe that he was even seeing. And he says, do you believe? George's healing does not constitute salvation. The fact that this man was healed did not mean he was saved. He was not saved because he was healed. That's why Jesus asked, do you believe in the Son of Man, the Messiah? That was the focal point of why Jesus Christ came to him in the first place. I think it is important to note that you do not need a miracle to believe in Jesus. Otherwise, we'd always have to have miracles for people to believe. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, we find that there are 10 lepers. 10 lepers. Now, if you understand who a leper is, it's a person that nobody approached. In fact, they had to tell you that they were a leper and that they were coming so everybody would get out of the way. And there were these 10 lepers, and they'd come to Jesus. And they'd asked to be healed. And out of those ten lepers, one was a, Samarit a Samaritan, a second-class human being, somebody that the Jews didn't really care about. And they asked Jesus to heal them, and all ten of them were healed. And as they were on the way, because he told them to go and be cleansed, because that was part of the process that was set up by Moses, when you were clean of a disease, you had to go to show yourself to the high priest or to the priest, and he'd check you to see if you're clean, and then you'll pronounce clean. So Jesus told them, go and be cleansed. And as they were on their way, the Samaritan, I kind of give it away, realized that he had been healed. And he turned and he went back to Jesus. And when he came to Jesus, what did Jesus say? Anybody know? You guys have read that story before? What did he say? Where are the other nine? Were they not healed also? 
And Jesus said in verse 19, Go, your faith has saved you. I will venture to say that the 19 received healing, but they didn't come to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Healing does not constitute salvation. They're not synonymous. So, one day, I'm not against healing. Physical healing is good. Believe me, when I got hurt with my Achilles tendon, Achilles tendon, slow down, Chris, I was happy to have it working again. If you get hurt, you want to get better. I believe in physical healing. But that is not the focal point here. Salvation is eternal healing for the soul and for the spirit. And one day, one day we'll find it. It says Matthew 22, verse 30. That's Jesus that was saying, we're not going to have bodies like this. You know, I can pick on Jill a little bit here in basketball. He can run up and down the court. And I'm huffing and puffing after him. One day, we're not going to have bodies that are going to get tired and going to wear out. That's also in Philippians 3.21 and 2 Corinthians 5.13. That's for then. But right now, we can receive spiritual healing, salvation. That can come to us now. Our souls can be touched and can be healed by Jesus Christ. And that is what he wanted to do for the guy I call George. He wanted to give him a chance to respond to salvation. So in verse 36, George says to him, Who is he, who is he, Lord, that I might be saved? No, sorry, that I want, I want to know him, excuse me. I like the ESV, I chose the ESV version because it says, And who is he, sir? Because in some versions it says, who is he, Lord? Well, in that culture, Lord could also mean someone who you show reverence to, but also Lord is in terms of master. And here they may help you make the difference. He was saying, sir, in, in respectful terms. Who was he? Because he didn't know who Jesus was. The marvelous thing that happened is that George said, I want to believe in the Messiah. Who is he? Who is he? I want to believe in this person. I don't know if you guys have done ministry, if you've shared with somebody, and you said, hey, Jesus Christ changed my life. Would you like to know Jesus Christ? And that person says, who is he? Don't you guys get a little jump in your heart? You're like, he, did, he, did this person say yes? They want to know Christ? I can imagine Jesus, the angels in the heaven. This guy says, I want to know him. This is good stuff. A few weeks ago, I don't know what time it was, JL had a bunch of kids up here who asked Jesus Christ into, his, into their lives. I was excited. I came to know the Lord as a young kid. It excites me to see people come to know who Jesus is. It's just a wonderful thing. And when somebody actually wants to know who Christ is, it makes you excited. I meet a lot of people who want to know a lot of stuff, but when you start, when it comes to Jesus Christ, they go blank. I played basketball in France. They liked it. Man, you're a good player. No, I really wasn't. When I fix something for them, oh man, you're a good mechanic. Mm, yeah. When I said Jesus, it was like, woo. So um, it was nice weather today, wasn't it? Somehow the subject always changes when you talk about Jesus. And here you meet someone who didn't change the subject. He's like, I want to know him. Tell me who this guy is. And then Jesus says, I am he. I am he. This is the I am part here again. And for, for George, this is a no-brainer. He says, I believe. I've saw, I saw what you did. I believe. And the next thing that followed was worship. Was worship. What a beautiful picture. 
someone who comes to know the Lord. And it's not just a head knowledge. It says he worshiped. He fell at Jesus' feet and worshiped him. It is very important that we underline this in our Bible. I don't know if you're one of those types that like to underline your Bibles. I like to do that sometimes. If you don't like to underline your Bibles, note it in a piece of paper. And if you have one of those electronic devices, just like me, you can highlight this part of Scripture. Because no Jew in their right mind, no Jew in their right mind would bow down before another man and worship him. I would dare say nobody in this room would, when they come to somebody, drop at their feet and worship them. We think you guys are crazy. Yet this man, when he said, I am he, he dropped at Jesus' feet and he worshipped him. There are certain people, even in Christian circles this morning, that do not believe that Jesus said he was God in the book of John. Well, this instance is a clear, clear indication that Jesus was saying he was God and he was deity. Because no Jew would ever bow down before a man and worship. Not only that, Jesus didn't say like the angels in Revelation 19.10. When John, the apostle that wrote this book, he was on the island of Patmos. And he had his vision and an angel came to him. But he didn't realize it was an angel. So he dropped on his feet to worship. And what did the angel say to him? He said, don't worship me. Don't worship me. I am a servant of the Lord just like you are. Don't do that. I might look strange to you, but I'm not God. I'm an angel. I'm a servant just like you. What did Jesus do when this man dropped at his feet? Did he say, oh, don't do that, man. That ain't cool. No. He received worship. He acknowledged that he was God. Jesus didn't back away from it saying, oh man, don't do that. You're going you're gonna to embarrass me. This man knew that he was in front of God. And when he bowed down, he worshiped. Because there was only one person who was capable to touch him the way he did. Blindness from birth. Science today still cannot heal a man who is blind from birth. And Jesus, with one little action, touched him, healed him, but did a greater thing. He said, your eyes, your physical eyes, that's one thing, but your spirit, your soul, that part of you that is eternal, I can touch that and change that forever. Do you want that? He's like, heck yeah. And he was down on his knees in front of Jesus. And Jesus gave him salvation. Jesus pronounced the words in verse 39. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew what was going on in the hearts of the Pharisees. Can you imagine the Pharisees are there somewhere on the sideline? According to the story, if we didn't have verse 39, you wouldn't know that Jesus was around people. But wherever Jesus went, there was always people, at least his disciples. And so this man didn't wait in some closet like Nicodemus in John chapter 3 to come and find Jesus. He was there, and there were people that were there looking at him, and he was down on his knees before Jesus. And the Pharisees were standing back saying, why is he doing that? That's just an ordinary man. They didn't believe. They didn't believe that Jesus was God. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They refused to accept the miracle that he did. So Jesus was just putting them in their place. If you want to stay blind, hey, you can choose darkness. If you want light, I can give you light. He came to give light. They did not want to recognize Jesus as being the Son of God. John chapter 3, 
verse 17 through 21. I'm going to read it. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. When it says judgment in here, sometimes we get all bent out of shape. Oh, judgment. Jesus is talking about salvation here. Jesus is talking about salvation. I know we have a hard time when somebody says, hey, you're a sinner. Woo, we all get bent out of shape. Did he just talk to me like that? No, Jesus is telling these Pharisees here, you have a choice. You accept the son, there's no condemnation. You don't accept the son, and you've already chosen judgment. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. The question of the Pharisees in verse 40 reveals a lot about where they were at spiritually. They refused to admit that they were sinners. They denied Christ's deity. When that man dropped on his knees before Jesus, all of them should have dropped on their knees before Jesus. He's king. He's Lord. He's God. But they didn't. They didn't. They denied Christ, his deity. They denied Christ's deity, and they were faithful to the laws of men. I say that is pride and prejudice. Sorry, ladies. Salvation begins when we recognize our true state, repent, and turn to God. The Pharisees hardened themselves to the gospel despite all that they saw. And Jesus said, because of that, your guilt remains. Personally, I am still digesting John chapter 9. Jesus placed his fingers or his finger on more than just a blind man's eye. It wasn't just an eye that he touched. He put his finger on the misconception of sin. Sorry. <laughs> that too. The misconception of God. The sin blame game. So was it the father or the mom who? No. So it must have been him. No. So who sinned? Sometimes we try to think for God. God doesn't want us to think for him. God wants us to submit to him. They were all worried about what God thought. We have misconceptions about God. There was fear of others. John chapter 9. What is this person going to think if I do this? At this church they do this and man, do I want to be part of this because, you know, the parents, they feared. They feared others. And then he also put his finger on pride. Me? A sinner? No. We are Mosesites. We follow Moses. We don't follow this guy. No matter they've never seen Moses in their life. Jesus did something and they chose not to believe. They were prideful. They didn't want to believe that they were sinners. They even said that this guy was a super sinner. He wasn't even worth being there. However, the greatest thing about John chapter 9 is that the will of God for a blind man happened, and that was salvation. He was rejected by men, but accepted by God. It might have taken a long time in the coming, but when he found out who Jesus was, he worshipped Jesus. 
I believe that Jesus still wants to transform lives like that today. I asked the Lord to increase my faith. I asked that he would increase all of our faith here this morning. To see, for me, at least one person come to the Lord. When I lived in France, I don't know if you guys have lived outside of this country. You guys live in a wonderful country, the United States. I thought, you live in a wonderful city, Heston. I think Heston has at least five churches, if I'm not mistaken. At least five. Anybody? Okay. We lived in Le Puy en Valais. There were two, three Protestant churches. One was a Reformed church, there was a Baptist church, and then there was us. And then there was a Catholic church. Le Puy en Valais has about 22,000 people. It's five square miles, and if you go a little bit farther out, it was about 30,000. Three churches. Three churches. And one of them, they didn't really believe in telling people about Jesus. You know, if you came to the church, that was cool. But outside of that, they really didn't go out. So when you meet somebody and you talk to them about Jesus, it's like, woo, okay, it's crazy people. They're evangelists. They call us evangelists. And anything that ends in an ist in French is considered extreme. So you didn't want to mess with evangelicals or you didn't want to mess with Baptists. You know, those people were just extreme. And so they avoided people. And I was saying, Lord, increase my faith. I would like to see one person save the month. I know that's a lot to ask, but I agree with Pastor JL when we went praying. Pray big prayers. Pray big prayers. Ask the Lord to do something. We don't have to be small in our prayers. Hey, the least that God could say is no or wait, right? But that's one of my desires is to see at least one person come to know the Lord. It hasn't happened yet, but he has allowed me to have a lot of opportunities to share the good news. And it's not always what we expect. I have two examples. I'll, I'll try and be quick. One, there was this guy at work. He had a crick in his neck. Well, I call it a crick in his neck. But his neck, he was walking around like this. I'm like, what's wrong with your neck? He's like, man, it's been bugging me for a few weeks. I'm like, okay. And then I left. You know, I wanted to tell him something, but I went back up during the week. Came back down. I had to do something. He was by the lathe. I said, so your neck still hurting? He says, yeah. I says, um, do you believe in prayer? He's like, yeah. He says, can I pray for your neck? He says, sure. Had I not asked, I'd never known that he wanted to be prayed for or wanted prayer. He told me that he had been a believer. Well, he didn't say he was a believer. He said that he'd gone to church up till he was 12 years old, and then he had never been to church since then. So I says, okay, Lord. All right, somebody that I can share with. Then Pastor Brad had these John, Gospel of John books to give. So I said, okay, well, I'll grab one of those books and I'll give it to him. And I, keep, I kept forgetting to give it to him. And then one day, I came and I brought it to him. I said, hey, read this book, and if you have any questions, ask me. Well, it wasn't a week later that he left the job. And he's now working somewhere else. And I'm saying, Lord, did I do something wrong? Did I scare him away? You know, it's always about us. It's not about us. It's about what God is doing. Sometimes we have to plant the seed. Sometimes we have to take the initiative and share. Second example. There's a guy at work. He's a, he's a believer. He came to know the Lord a few years ago. And I just happened to meet him, and he started to share his experience with me. And he told me to pray for his wife because his wife was ill. She had a mass in her abdomen that was the size of a softball, and they, didn't know what, 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 no, they did not know what it was. So he said, pray for her. But he says, more importantly, pray for her salvation. And they've been married for a long time, and the marriage wasn't really doing 
very well. I mean, they were ready to get a divorce, he told me. He says, if you really want to know. So I said, hey, the least I can do is pray. So I said, I'd pray for him. And then I kept coming every week. Hey, how is your wife doing? He says, well, we got the mass removed. It wasn't cancer, and she's doing good. But you can keep praying for my wife. So, kept praying. Two Sundays ago, I got to talk to him, and he was almost in tears. He said, you wouldn't believe what happened. He says, I was in church Sunday, and two people came up to pray for me. And says, hey, can we pray for you? He says, out of the blue. He says, he doesn't know who they were. And then he says he went home that day, and he was speaking to his wife. And for the first time in there, since the period he came to the Lord, she actually listened to what he had to say about the gospel. And he said he started to cry. He couldn't believe that. She's not saved, but she's getting close. Her heart is softened. The Lord touched her heart. Something the Lord did. He's doing something. Can I ask you guys to pray along with me for Bonnie? That she could come to know Christ. Enjoy true healing. Healing of the soul. Hurts that people have probably inflicted on her. Why she's been so hard. Heal their marriage. God could heal anything if we allow him to. He wants to do that. I want to see God change my life. I want to see God change others. And so perhaps you're here this morning and someone has rejected you. Know that Christ is here for you. Maybe you are very religious, but you have not yet yielded your life to Christ. He's here for you also this morning. Or you are someone, you're just in need of the Lord touch. He's here. The presence of the Lord is here this morning to do exactly that. He wants to heal and transform your life. John 8, 12, and this is a version that I translated. It's a French version that I like the wording, so I translated it. It says, I am the light of the world. This is Jesus saying, speaking here. Whoever follows me will not walk around groping in obscureness. He will see clearly to navigate in life. I like how it worded that. Jesus has not given up on you. Just like he came to that man a second time, he also wants to come and visit with you. Here's a song that I like. It goes like this. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness. Open my eyes and let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Is God the object of your affection this morning, if you're a believer? Is he the subject of your life? And are you subject to him? Is he your Lord? Probably you're not a believer here this morning. He is Lord, and if you allow him a chance, he can transform your life forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that when others don't see, you do. Lord, I don't know how many people pass by that blind man. Probably threw a few coins at him. But Lord, you stopped and you touched his eyes. But you weren't just there for his eyes. You were there for his soul. And God, when you came back to him, you came to offer him life, eternal life. Lord, that is still the same today. You're here to offer all who will eternal life. You're here to offer all who will a, re a relationship with you. Jesus the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. I pray that you'd guide us. Lord, lead us to those relationships. Lead us to those people that you'd bless this week and that you'd guide us as we pray, Lord, that you'd answer and that you'd lead in your name.
Amen. Thank you, Chris. Our closing.